ladies and gentlemen, this is Trisha with Insectopia here to um, show off a um, another uh, buggy here under the microscope. This is a um, this is a monarch butterfly. I know we've done a monarch butterfly in the past, and admittedly, um, at this point, the monarch butterfly is gorgeous. We love it. It is unfortunately missing its abdomen, and so. I mean, I have the abdomen, but it is not, at the moment, affixed to the butterfly. <laughs> um, monarchs are great, but I'm sure you can bulk out your collection. Of course! I honestly thought that I had red admirals and painted ladies and those types of things, like something a little bit different that we could talk about brush-footed butterflies with and invalids. Um, but, I mean, the monarch is a brush-footed butterfly, it's just, <clears throat> it's just so well known. It's cool to do, you know, things that are a little bit off the wall. And, yes, Susan, I still absolutely would love to and want to come out to Albany. So, um, yes, that would be epic. And I'd love to see, I'd love to see the Lycenids and all the cool butterfly spots. Um... Yeah, I regularly have collected, primarily at nighttime, admittedly. I, I'm a real nocturnal um, collector, so I end up with a lot of moths. I end up with a lot of beetles and wasps and those types of things that are coming to lights. And then a good number of um, pollinators, because going to flowers and going and collecting in fields is another thing that I love. Um... I don't have a huge number of things like dragonflies, damselflies, and butterflies, and those are things that you have to chase in the summer heat. <laughs> um, but that's gonna be that's gonna be my new plan this um, summer is to really bulk out my butterfly collection because I do know that a lot of you like to um, a lot of you like to discuss and collect and draw and check out butterflies. <laughs> oh, a cool spot for satyrs. That's awesome. All right, so this is a male monarch butterfly. Um, we can tell because it has these spots on the hind wing right there and right there on those veins, right? So those, this vein here, when it comes down off of the cell, there's that little bit of a widened region um, that's kind of a little bit of a darker spot. That's actually a scent gland for the males. Um, so that uh, is how we tell the males. That's a scent gland, and that's how I tell the males from the females. And um, in monarch butterflies, you can very easily see the wing venation because the because um, the dark lines along the wings actually follow the veins, which is kind of a nifty thing. Um, butterflies tend to be one of those simpler ones to um, draw because we're not going to spend a lot of time discussing mouth parts. We're not going to spend <clears throat> we're not going to spend a lot of time discussing the legs or those types of things. We're going to be drawing the body and then looking at the wings and some of the detailing in them. Um, uh, blue, blue, blue. I don't see my ruler. This monarch butterfly is too big to show off under the microscope all at one time. In fact, the view that you're seeing over there is as far zoomed out as we get. So, if you would like, um, oops, if you would like a uh, a larger picture of the monarch butterfly, here you are. You can take it and pause it. Um, you can take a screenshot of it, you can take a picture of it with your phone, but that um, can help you out when we are zooming in, looking at individual features to make sure all of the, um, your insect it stays um, in the correct ratios. Because when we start zooming in, it's hard to tell. Alright, so here we are, way up here at the top, monarch butterfly. And the species on monarch butterflies is Dineus plexippus. Uh, they are in the family Nymphalidae, um, which is uh, the family name for brush-footed butterflies. Dineus 
Plexippus. Now, the monarch butterfly here in the United States has been listed as an endangered species. So, um, we can no longer collect the monarch butterfly. In fact, you're not even supposed to collect the caterpillars and bring them inside anymore and help them grow up. Right? Because of the controlled status on the monarch butterfly, we are supposed to be allowing them to live out their life outdoors. Now, right? There is some, there are some belief systems out there that believe that the human interaction with the monarch butterflies might be what is actually causing a lot of their, um, a lot of their population drop because when people bring in hundreds of monarch caterpillars, uh, sometimes they don't end up cleaning in between, um, in between caterpillars or really bleaching down their stuff. And um, we've seen people trying to care and take care of the monarch butterfly actually spreading a disease, spreading um, a disease that's already natural in the population. Um, but normally those butterflies would either, one, die off, or two, not infect very many other butterflies. But when you bring a diseased specimen inside and you don't know, you, one, keep it alive and you care for it so it's not going to naturally die off in the population like it would have. And, two, um, it's now going to be in an environment where it has the ability to um, hurt other monarch butterflies. So, if you enjoy bringing caterpillars into your house and caring for them and raising them, I love doing that too. Just make sure that you're not doing that with our monarchs because they're endangered now and it's no good. We want these populations. All right, so, is it hemolymph that froze that flows through the wing veins? Yes! Um, the hemolymph does flow through the wing veins, but the hemolymph only flows through the wing veins when the butterfly is first emerging out of the chrysalis. So once the butterfly is fresh out of the chrysalis and it starts to blow out its wings, that's when its hemolymph or its blood is um, pushing and pulsing through all of those long, all of those veins. And that's what's going to help the butterfly's wings unravel and expand. And then we've all heard that term that butterfly's wings have to dry out. So what that is, is they will actually close the circulation to those veins, all right, at the base. And then they'll beat their wings and dry them out. And th at that point, there is no longer hemolymph flowing through the wings. That's why when um, a butterfly or a moth gets injured, um, they don't bleed out of their wings, right? At that point, it's like um, losing a piece of your fingernail or a piece of hair. What disease is it? Um, I cannot remember the disease because it is a scientific name. I don't remember if it has a common one. Um, I do know that you can avoid spreading it by thoroughly bleaching your equipment, that, and many people don't end up doing that. Okay. So we're going to go ahead and start on our butterfly here. Um, keep in mind that we need to be leaving a whole bunch of space for our wings here. Um, the wings go off on both sides. Now, um, when you are spreading butterflies, uh, this is a specimen I like to use as an example because you can see this really nice straight line that's horizontal. Oops, I hit the pin. This really nice straight line that's horizontal that goes all the way across the body. Those front wings line up and make a straight line in the back. That is your ideal for um, for collection spread music butterflies, right? So sometimes when you see spread butterflies, they're a little bit more relaxed or they're a little bit higher, and um, that can be a creative decision if you're putting it in a display case. But if you um, if you're ideally putting it into a museum or keeping it for research purposes, our goal is 180 degrees, one straight line that is 90 degrees from the body. So they can, these are straight. Is it insanely named? I have no idea. Honestly, Alex, I'm not sure what the species, what the disease of the butt monarchs is called. I just know that we were regularly spreading it. 
All right, here we go. So we've got a pretty small head up here on the top. Um, monarch butterflies, along with a lot of other pollinators, can actually see ultraviolet light with these eyes. Um, so I'm just going to start with kind of a small D-shaped head. You know me, I like to start with this with this kind of shape and then modify it as we go along. The, uh, the thorax is um, quite round here um, and it's a little bit, it's, it's significantly wider than the head here. So when we come back down to the thorax, I'm just going to give... There we go. So we've got a nice kind of wide thorax. That's where all the legs are connected. That's where the wings are connected. And the thorax tends to be fairly boxy, especially in butterflies and moths, because um, when you've got the this like square, it's easy to put the wings up on the top and for muscles to do this, to kind of pump the wings so that they can fly. Um, and the musculature in the thorax is in such a way that back in the day, um, before we had other methods, um, entomologists would use the pinch method. If you pinch the thorax of a butterfly or a moth too hard, you can actually, you can, um, sadly, unfortunately, but it's good for collecting, you go either way, um, you can actually break those muscle connections on the wings so they can't flap anymore. So you have to be really careful um, when you're holding them, because if you hold them too tight, you can, um, you can uh, stop them from flying, although that does stop them from damaging their wings if you're using them in a collection. Um, so if you're out in the field, that's a, a fun little side note. Now, um, I have looked a couple of times now, I'm not seeing it, so, um, I am going to leave, I'm going to leave the abdomen blank for now, and then when we are doing our, like, our final run through of our specimen, what I'll probably do is add the abdomen really lightly, um, because we can't see it, but I know what it looks like. All right, um, that's kind of against nature journaling rules because we want to draw it kind of as we see it and the information that we are gaining from this specimen at this time. So that's why I would go back and forth about adding the abdomen versus not. All right, so when I'm looking at getting a kind of a light sketch done of the outside of the wings, what I'm trying to do at this point is get the basic shapes taken care of and then when we zoom in, we can add all of the fine details and the veins and those types of things. So when I look at the front wing here, my goal is to get this triangular shape onto our, onto our sketch. So we're starting off from the top of the thorax and we are going up. And right at the tip of the front wing, um, it comes out just a little bit. So when we are when we make it all the way out to the tip, we just need to make sure that it rounds and it comes back just a little bit before coming down. And then once we get to about halfway down the thorax, right around here, this is where that straight line is going to come across. And you can add just a little bit of a rounded corner right here. Now, we might end up shifting some of this. Let's see. But I'm pretty happy with that shape to start off with. And then for our hind wing here, I like to start at the base and work out. So I'm going to start first right here where our hind wing um, separates from the front wing right around here. And this stays nice and round until right around here when it goes pretty much straight back. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the from the bottom of my thorax and I'm going to come kind of down And then what I want to do is create this nice round hind wing, but we don't want it to go past the front wing, right? So 
Let's see, I might... Something around that size. at least where we're starting, but I will admit that my head got really, really big. The head and the thorax got really big in comparison to the space I had on my paper. So what I'm going to do before we start zooming in is I'm actually going to divide, I'm going to split it in half. That's how big I had it. I'm going to cut it in half. That's much better. Yep, that's how I'm happy with it. All right, so let's zoom into the head. For insects with compound eyes, did each of the different eye components, let's see, all right, eye components have the capacity to detect all of the colors that the organism it can see, or are the components specialized? Um, I'm going to give you some fun, fun words. The individual components in a compound eye, those are called the omatidia. Um, that's plural for omatidia. All right. And the omatidia, um, they are individual. They do have specialized components individually. Um, so some of them will see certain colors, some of them will see other colors, some of them can see all of the colors, but it's going to be kind of mix-matched, um, and it also is going to depend on species. Uh, insect eyes get, gets really, really complicated really fast when you're talking about how many cones they have and which colors are sensitive where. Um, the example that I like to use is with dragonflies, actually, because dragonflies um, have different layers of the aromatidia on the compound eye. They can see both different colors and they have different focal lengths. So some of them are nearsighted and some of them are farsighted. I always make the head and thorax too big on butterflies. Yeah! I feel like that that is a... At butterflies and praying mantids, I have a really hard time making sure that the head stays the right side. Um, Matidia, right? Is that how they're called? Yes, that is. Um, we should check if there's hairs between the Omatidia. Sure, let's go check it out. I don't believe that butterflies do, just our honeybees. And you can see here, we're nice and zoomed in. There is no hairs coming out of those compound eyes. No CD. Susan loves a hairy eyeball. You know what? Just for you, Susan, I think I still have... Here. Oh, no. I have my honeybee wing loaded. I don't have my honeybee eye loaded. I thought I did. Oh, there it is. They're just, just for you, um, Susan, the hairy eyeball of a honeybee. <laughs> All right. Red admirals have hair on their compound eyes? I need to see this. I'm excited. <laughs> Giving someone the hairy eyeball. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. So now that we are looking at our compound eye here, or at the head here, we can add all of the fun details to our cute little head. Now, um, when I'm drawing the compound eyes, I will go inside and outside of the shape that I've already built. So this is kind of the shape that I've imagined that our butterfly head is, and I'm going to make sure that it stays nice and small. All right. Now, what I do... 
What I do is I go inside of that shape and I'm gonna add kind of parentheses that are, um, that are opposite and then I'm going to go past the edge at which we already kind of planned the head. All right, so you're gonna go past that. That's gonna make your, uh, your eyes look like they are kind of bulging a little bit away from the head here, and that's what we want. Also, to make sure you have leave all the, that space for all those omatidia, I like to cross hatch within my compound eyes. Now, um, the head region um, here, let's see. At the base of the head, it connects to the thorax so smoothly that it's really tricky to see the back at where the head ends and the thorax starts. Um, but what I can tell you is that the, thor the thorax is very rounded and it's almost, um, it's almost kind of over top of the head here. So we're going to make the bottom of the head this arch because then we have uh, because then it looks like the thorax is kind of over top of the uh, head a little bit and way up here at the front um, it's not all rounded here you can see that it kind of goes up and it spikes these right here let's see this right here and this right here if I was to turn our butterfly sideways, it looks a little bit like this. We've got this big compound eye here, and then we've got the head, and then we've got the proboscis, and then you've got one, two. And these two pieces that come up, these are modified labial palps. And so when you're looking at it from here, it just looks like two spikes. From here at the, um, in front of the head, it looks like there's an M, one, two. But those, um, but those kind of spiked portions are the tops of the labial palps that start at the mouth parts and come all the way up. And then um, on the inside, we've got those nice antenna Butterflies, you know, they have what we would call knobbed antenna. Um, our scientific word for that is clavate. Clavate antenna. <coughs> so when we say clavate, we just, we mean some more like a butterfly antenna and less like a clubbed beetle antenna. When we're saying knobbed, we just mean that the end of the antenna expands a little bit. Not like there's a big ball at the end of the antenna, right? Just kind of, it doesn't narrow at the end, it grows at the end. That's what we're gonna call a knobbed antenna. And it has so many segments on this antenna that we're never gonna count them, all right? These are, the segmentation on a butterfly's antenna is very, very fine. And Let's draw it like this first, and then I can um, zoom in and show you some of the individual segmentation. So we're going to start here, kind of in between the compound eye and the labial palps, and we're going to move up the, uh, uh, the antenna, move up about a third up the length of the front wing. Ow. Okay. I don't know how many of you out there wear glasses, but every now and again when a hair gets caught in glasses, not fun. All right. So we're going to start just on one side. We're going to come up and just let it go over. And I, and I went a little bit longer than I planned to, but that's okay. All right. There it is. Now when I'm making expand, now when I'm making my knobbed antenna, I will generally create the knob at the end and then just ensure that I get it nice and thin on the way back. Um, but that needs to be narrower for a little bit longer. There. 
right, so you've got that long guy here, and then it's got a knob at the end. And let's go ahead and zoom in and check out some of these individual segments on the antenna. Looks like a golf putter. Yeah, a little bit like that. them a little bit. So if you look at this um, antenna here on the left, turn on the lighters up my boobs. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You see all of these little lines that go across where you see those bumps? Those are all individual segments. So I would estimate a hundred. Like, there's a whole bunch of segments all the way up this. Alright, let's go look at the thoracic region here. Admittedly, it is just incredibly cetose. <laughs> Fluffy is not the scientific term for it. Cetose is. But um, cetos just means covered in hair, all right? It doesn't have to be actually fluffy for it to be cetos. It just needs to be covered in hairs. Now, um, we had this discussion recently, but the scales on butterfly wings are modified hairs. But we generally call the ones on the wing scales and the ones on the body CT. So hair is CT. Now, um, I'm going to go ahead, I'm actually, I'm pretty happy with this size of my thorax here. I'm going to make it a little bit narrower, um, and instead of being so wide there, I'm actually going to run my, um, my thorax a little bit more parallel to itself, and then come back in. More of a point at the end of the thorax, and then when we add the abdomen, it'll kind of go around that point. <clears throat> now, uh, butterflies are known for having nice, long, thin bodies in comparison to moths, right? So butterflies tend to be nice, long, and thin. They tend to fly during the daytime, and they tend to have um, knobbed antenna instead of um, bipectinate or feathered antenna. My hair isn't long enough to get caught in my glasses, but sometimes my fingernails do. Oh no! Do, alright, so yes, the butterfly abdomen deflates a little bit when they pass. Um, the butterfly abdomen is also full of oils, so if you leave your butterfly and your moth's abdomens when you spread them, sometimes that oil from the abdomen will leak onto the wings and cause discoloration. So regularly in specimens, especially specimens that were collected to be displayed in a like a display case, they will have they won't have their abdomen connected or they'll have like a fake abdomen. Um, just to keep the wings next to it nice. But on my specimens, I try and keep them nice. Um, and I still have the abdomen. I do plan on gluing it back together. It's just that this is the only specimen I have. Um, do the thoraxes deflate as well? No. Um, the abdomen is soft, kind of squishy, so it's going to kind of deflate when the gut's dry. But because the thorax is structurally stable and it's got all that musculature in the center, it doesn't deflate like, um, like the abdomen does. I like 
to look at the scales on the wings. So we're going to take one really quick second and zoom in on the scales on this butter on the monarch's wings just to see what they look like. The um, the scales themselves do actually serve their own purpose. All right, it's not just to make the butterflies. Um, colorful, even though that is something that they do. They, um, they, without the scales, butterflies and moths are clear. Um, but they also, when the sun hits those scales, they, it, um, it spreads the heat over the entire wing so that the wing doesn't end up with hot spots while it's flying. So that is one thing that those scales do. Secondarily, some of the scales, especially on nocturnal moth, moths, um, the, the scales will actually help them um, help, like, muffle bat radar, which is cool. They have this really crazy texture that, that makes it so that when the, um, when the sonar bounces off of them, it doesn't, tell, it doesn't send the right message back. Cool. All right, so we're going to check out some wings here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take this butterfly. This is as far zoomed out as we get. I'm going to leave it focused right about here, and then I'm going to take, um, take our butterfly back over here to the drawing so that I can look at it a little bit. So... When we got the outline of the butterfly's wing quickly, right, um, I just wanted to kind of get it started. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to look really closely and I'm going to make sure that all of my lines match. So we're looking at this top line right here on the top of our wing. And I'm actually pretty happy with this arch here. It might go up. Yeah, just a little bit more. All right, so I'm going to darken this line here and then erase any of these sketch lines that I don't need around it. Okay. And then once we get to the very end of this um of this front wing, uh, we have this little knob here at the end, and I'm just making sure that this curve is this curvature is nice. Um, I think I made mine just a little bit wide here, so I'm going to narrow it up just a little bit and kind of even out the even it out here. Okay, so that's going to be how I leave my, um, that's going to be how I leave that front wing. Now all we need is this nice straight line across, except that you can see actually on the microscope where it starts, it's not a completely straight line. Oh, I, I have got to get rid of that video. Here we are. Um... It comes up and comes down just a little bit before it straightens out. When we're looking at it from afar, it looks like a, a nice straight line. But there is a little bit of a wave right here at the base. So I'm going to start up just a little bit above this line we've already sketched. Kind of start above it and then come down to that line and then go straight over. It's not going to be a huge difference, but it's going to be enough of a difference that it's going to... Um, make our butterfly look more realistic. And on this hind wing, So here's something funny that you can see on this specimen because the abdomen is not here. Right here on the inside on the inside of these hind wings, normally what you would see is this vein here and then forward, and this vein here and then that way. But you can actually see these lobes here on the inside. 
Um, those are what we call the anal lobes. Um, those are on the, uh, the bottom side of the wings, and they fold down a little bit, so that they're kind of like holding on to the abdomen just a little bit. So the abdomen runs in between them, and they fold against the body. Um, so that's something that normally we can't see, but because the abdomen's not there, we can actually see it. So that's kind of nifty. All right. So, I'm going to start over here. I'm actually pretty happy with the size, but because our abdomen is missing, there's a part of me that wants to add the anal lobe here to the bottom of, to the bottom of my wing. So it would start where we already started, but it would actually come out a little bit and then come back in with that lobe and then come down. And it's going to look kind of silly to add that because the body is not there, but also it's realistic. Alright, so we've got all of our wings situated. Now all we have to worry about are all of these veins. So, um, many of you know the costa, spelled C-O-S-T-A, -S is the strongest vein in a monarch butterfly's wings, and it runs along, runs along the front of the front wing, right about here. That's going to be the strongest vein in the entire body, and on our monarch butterfly, it's nice and darkened here all the way up to the tip, with the exception of one, two, three white spots. So... If I was going to start that, I'm actually going to just create a nice wide dark band here that goes all the way up. And then what I'll end up doing is just spot is just erasing those couple of spots when we get there. All right. When we are looking at wing venation, a lot of times what I base my wing venation off of in the butterflies is the cell on the front and the hind wing. Trying to get as much of this cell in view as possible. See the lobe from the underside when the wings are held folded. Yes, you can. You can see that lobe from when the butterfly is holding its wings over top. In fact, that lobe is going, a lot of times when you see a butterfly from the side, you can't really see its abdomen very well. Maybe you see a little bit of the bottom of the abdomen, but most of the time their abdomens aren't really visible, and it's because the lobe is kind of covering it. So I'm looking at where this cell comes all the way up. This is past the halfway point of our um, of our front wing here. So if I was going to look from here to here, I would say that that cell goes right about goes right about to here, just a little bit past. If I was going to say this is about halfway, just a little bit past halfway, and that. This vein here comes down and is going to create that nice big guy. All right. But then once we get right around here, I don't want to connect it just yet because I do believe that there's something funky happening here. Yep. I'll show you. There we are. So, when we look at the end of this cell, instead of it just going straight, it comes back a little bit and then goes forward. We've got this little bit of a zigzag up here at the top. 
All right, now we've got a series of veins. A lot of butterflies are identified based off of the number of veins that are coming off of this cell here. And um, in nymphalids, the brush-footed butterflies, they are easiest. The, they are easiest to identify not based on their vein, wings, but just based on the fact that their front legs are minimized. All right, they have. If you see one of these butterflies and they land, and when they land and you count their legs, you count four instead of six, it means that their front legs are modified to be kind of short and stubby, and we call them brush-footed, and those are the nymphalidae. If you see a butterfly and it lands and it has four legs instead of six, we're going to call it a nymphalidae. That's the scientific name for those. All right, so I'm counting one, two, three off of the bottom of this cell here. So right about up halfway, we're going to go all the way out to the end. One, a little bit higher, two, and then wait up here at the top, right before it kind of starts to go in, we've got three. And this third one, it does kind of arch, angle down just a little bit, and it's going to hit right as the wing is getting narrower here. So we're going to be taking there we go, my pencil is starting to work. Alright, here, and we're going to be going all the way to right around here. And I will admit these are supposed to be equal distant apart and so because I have moved where I thought this was going to be I'm just going to do the top and the bottom and then make sure that I get this middle one right about here in the middle. That's a happy vein. Alright, now here past this we've got one, two, three. I do believe that's correct. Let's look at it under the microscope really quick. Yes. So when we are looking at the very tip of the wing, right about here, we've got one, and we have two more, um, two more veins coming off of the bottom here. So we've got one, two, three, coming up to the top, and then. This, there is a coastal vein in here, and it does kind of separate a little bit away from this dark spot, and it'll come down just a little bit at the end. And that, oh, we've got the anal vein to do. So at the very, very back side of our, of our, of our wing here, a lot of times you're going to have an A vein, or the anal vein, and it's, um, connected right to the bottom and then it, it goes all the way along the bottom of the vein. It doesn't, or the wing, it doesn't split, it doesn't run into anything. It just starts right around here and ends right around here. It goes like this and just follows that all the way across. Now, if you wanted to add the, um, if you want to add the colorations and the shading, you can also be my guest. Um, the shading is happening right up here around the tip, right at the end of this, um, at the end of this cell here. So you've got a whole lot of darker regions here, and then coming around, and then the black border goes all the way around the outside of our monarch. So. If you wanted, you could add shading, you could add color if you would like. But it's going to be darkest on the edges, and then we have this kind of striping here. And you have a variety of kind of these really pretty orange, yellow orange speckles here on the tips of our wings. Alright, for the hind wing, we've got another cell that we can work off of, and I love that. These cells make the butterfly wings pretty easy to, to manipulate and work with. So, 
we're just gonna be following this shape here. So this cell comes down to about two thirds into the vein, into the wing. So from here, it's gonna come all the way about two thirds in. The bottom side of this cell comes out and arches down and around, kind of like that. Let's go and put the uh, put the hind wing under the microscope really quick. There you are. So now you can see that cell that we were working on. There is a little bit of, um, so you can see the veins are very straight until they hit a vein and then it, and then it bends a little bit. So we might be, we might want to make sure that it's not so wavy. It's going to come straight down. It's going to come over. I'm going to come out and then it's going to go. The one on the top only goes about a third of the way the, to the, um, like a third of the length of the front wing here. So this is actually a pretty short vein. It only goes right around there. And then it's going to start to come on down and connect here. And that is going to give us our cell for our hind wing. And we can add these sensory organs here. So, um... We're going to skip these two. These would both be anal veins, so we would call them A1 and A2. Um, this one here has that cool nifty little male scent gland, so that's where we're going to start. Um, it starts right here at that first corner we had, and it's going to wrap down to right around there. And right up here at the top, that is where that male scent gland exists. Now at the end, right about here, we've got two, one, two, coming off of the, uh, coming off of the end, and then we've got two more, one, two, and then off of this very, very top, there is one more cell, but it goes up and it kind of goes and gets hidden underneath the front wings. Um, but it kind of goes up and then gets hidden a little bit. Then we just need these two anal veins. We've got one coming down like this, and then one that comes down a little bit closer to that anal lobe. All right, and then that dark, uh, that dark border around the edge of the wings, I just drop a little bit of graphite down and then smudge it out to give me some of that shading. I know many of you use colors, so if you're using colors out there, please do. Um, I hope to one day add colored pencils into my drawings and my lives. I think that would be so much fun. I just have to learn how to use them first. Use them on my private stuff before I go live with them. Alright, so that is what my monarch butterfly looks like just from the, the head, the thorax, and these wings here. If I was going to add the abdomen, I would probably add it nice and long and narrow. Um, and then there is some segmentation in our abdomen, so you can add some of those segments, although segments in the abdomen are really tricky to see because um, of all of the CD, all of the hair on the abdomen. So that is kind of like our little false abdomen that we can add or we can imagine in. Um, admittedly, because we can see this lobe here, it, it, it almost looks a little funny, like somebody picked up the hind wing and put it on top of the abdomen rather than letting it fold around it. But I think that it's kind of a cool look. All right, um, let's see. So that is our monarch butterfly. Bright orange because they have these warning colors. Do the spots line up with these segments? Let me 
look. Yes. The spots on the abdomen line up with not individually on each segment, but the spots actually line up with the edges of the segments. So if I was going to, if we were looking at the, um, at the monarch's abdomen, here, let me draw you one. So if we've got our abdomen here and we have a segment, a segment, a segment, those white spots, they exist here at the, at where the segments divide. So you've got all of this is dark, black, and then you've got these white spots that exist along the segments. And, um, some specimens, um, a, a lot of specimens, in fact, it's going to be just the white spots on the left and then on the right. But it's always going to be kind of where those abdominal segments um, are separate. Um, podcast the other day by a doctor and her comedian husband and they were discussing the 10 deadliest bugs um did uh did they list the deadliest bug as a mosquito i would not say that a butterfly the monarch butterfly is in the top 10 deadliest bugs I don't know how many monarch butterflies you would have to eat for it to kill you, but I do not think that eating one butterfly would kill a person. That's silly. It doesn't even kill a bird. One monarch butterfly, excuse me, one monarch butterfly will make a bird throw up. It'll make them sick. That's very odd. All right, so um, we have warning colors, right? This bright red, bright orange color that helps us warn them because they are toxic. Um, because they are toxic, but they are not deadly toxic. Uh, does anybody, this is a bonus, uh, this is a bonus word. I'll go ahead and give it to you if you don't know, but does anybody know the scientific way, the scientific phrase that we, that we use for warning colors? Because you can say warning colors, that's a, that's a fair statement, that's uh, like the common way to say it. But scientists have an even better phrase, and e some even better words to use rather than warning colors. Ah, Susan Ann of Isave have got it, yay! Aposomatic coloration. You guys are great. I love it so much. You can call it aposematism. Um, to describe, or you can use the word aposomatic coloration. <laughs> Duh. Don't eat butterflies, guys. Here's something really cool. I don't think I showed you this the last time because it's a little tricky for me to do. But I think that if I'm steady enough, I can show this to you. butterfly and I thought that it would be really cool to show you the proboscis because you can kind of see it so right there along the bottom where it's that nice round kind of shinier part that is the little proboscis of our monarch butterfly 
And not only does it have um, white spotting on the abdomen, but there are, is white spotting around on the head and on the thoracic region, especially when um, their wings are closed. You can see it a lot better. Um, also, don't eat viceroys. Ah, yes. So viceroys are also toxic. And I learned something cool about viceroys recently, in the past couple of weeks. Um, <coughs> viceroy butterflies are the same species across the country, but they have little subspecies because wherever the viceroy is, depending on where the viceroy is in the country, it will have slightly lighter colors or slightly darker colors. So in the south, like around Florida, where there are a lot of both monarch butterflies and queen butterflies, the viceroy is going to be a really, really dark orange, almost like a rusty orange color, like a burnt orange, um, because they're trying to mimic kind of both the monarchs and the, the queen butterfly, and the queen is a lot of a darker orange color butterfly, whereas the... Um, the viceroys up here in Michigan in the New York regions where we don't have those queen butterflies are going to be the really bright orange color of the monarch. And I just think it's so cool when one species has different color forms and different color variations depending on where they are and the environment that they've been placed and the other individuals that are living in that environment with them. So that's cool. All right, and I'm a little bit behind, so let's see. Bloop, bloop, bloop. Ooh, is that a bit of chatoyancy on the eye? Can you rotate it very slowly with the eye in focus? I can try. I almost thought I saw a little bit of, like, a metallic blue chatoyancy around... Oh, this is, this is going to work really well, actually. Let's see. on this guy. It's just a little trickier. Alright, I'm not seeing any chatoyancy in the eye, but here, I'm gonna get it into focus. In theory. at this angle, I have to hold it rather than put it in a solid surface, so we're also fighting my shaking hands, and I apologize for that. Yes, the Queen Mimic and the Monarch Mimic Viceroy's interbreed and and. And so they are considered the same species, even though they have different subspecies. So I'm not seeing any chatoyancy in the compound eye, no like metallic colors, but I swear I saw some metallics 
when we were looking earlier. But now I don't know where they would have been coming from. I thought maybe like the legs, sometimes butterfly legs can be like metallic-y blue, but not on this butterfly. Not seeing any metallics. Some cool, vi some cool images though of uh, this monarch. Alright, let's see. A sort of asterisk in the eye? You know what? I don't see it, but I would believe you if you saw it. Alright? Like, I am, um, I'm not here to argue with what you do and do not see. It does look like an asterisk. Okay, so somebody sees it! Awesome! I, um, if you do a class on geology, I'd love to learn a little bit more about rocks. You know, I was actually wondering that when we turned this... Some butterflies actually have... Some butterflies have ocelli along with their compound eyes. They have simple eyes too that are kind of buried in the hair. But I'm not... Seeing the sim I'm not seeing simple eyes on this butterfly. Doesn't mean she doesn't have them, it just means I can't see them. I like the differentiation between the black hairs and the white hairs on the head. So I'll show you this. The, uh, the black hairs on the head are long and thin, just like you'd imagine the fluff on the hairs. But if you look right there in the center, that little white spot, those are flat and scale-like, like the butterfly's wings. Um, and it looks like a little heart. So cute. Okay, so, um... On my list of buggy friends, I wrote that we were going to do Oh, there they are. Okay. I wrote that we were going to do a water strider next week. Um, and I actually do have the, uh, I do have a specimen of a water strider. Admittedly, its legs are all wonky, which is why we have not done one yet. But, um, we might as well try it out. We can discuss water striders, their ability to walk on water, and how, um, the, and how oil slicks, uh, affect their ability to walk on water. If we're seeing it through the camera and Trisha is not because she looks through the lens directly, I'm guessing the asterisk is a moir. I'm not sure what a moir is, but if it if that's like a synonym for some type of mirage, that would almost be my guess. Um, because, yeah, when I'm looking at it through the microscope, I'm not seeing anything like that, so it might be just like the reflection of the light. Um, but that's what Trojancy is, right? The reflection of the light to create iridescence. Pronounced Moire. Oh! Oh, that's a Moire. <laughs> oh, that's funny. All right, I think we are, I think we're good for the day. Um, I am so excited for the bugs to come out, all right, ladies and gentlemen? It was so warm for a minute there, and now it's, we have this freeze crossing the country, and everything is, 
and everything is going and hiding again. And I was finally getting reports from students who were seeing bumblebees. And if you see bumblebees this early in spring, like really early bumblebees, they're all queens. They're all looking for places to start their colony this year. Um, so if you go outside and you're seeing bumblebees flying around, those are the queens um, looking for their new hive because none of the um, none of the workers and none of the drones survive the winter. Only the queen survives. Um, she's gonna go into diapause and hide somewhere to stay warm, and everybody else dies. And then she comes out in the spring and stretches out her wings and starts the next starts another colony. Western controversy bug. Okay, yeah, that's kind of a bug. We, it counts. <laughs> uh. All right. Well, I hope that everybody had a good time here today. I know that we uh, we had a good number of people here joining us and chit chatting, especially in the beginning. I saw some new names. Um. I believe Alex Shepard, and I really appreciated some of his like um, some of our some of our questions here. And thank you so much to Susan and Avea and Dakota um, for hanging out and asking all the questions and keeping my chat interesting. That's really all I ask, you know. Um, when you are out there asking questions, um, um, interacting with each other, chit-chatting, um, even joking about the bugs, all of those things um, uh, I can play off of and I can kind of help teach and do all those types of things. So I always appreciate when you are, um, when you're chit-chatting and asking questions and all the things. That's my out school page. I teach to kiddos, ages 5 to 8, 9 to 12. Find the description box below. Um, I also ask that you subscribe to the channel if you've not already. Um, I know I'm speaking to the choir because everybody here is subscribed because you are chatting with me. But if you're not subscribed yet, go ahead and do that. Um, then hit the little notification bell so you know when we're going live. Um, Right there is my tip box. You can feel free to drop a couple dollars in there if you'd like. Um, that's just let me know I had a good class today. Um, helps me uh, helps me stay on top of my costs um, with keeping the collection alive and happy. Um, and then this is my email address. You can always email me. I love hearing from people. I will admit the last couple of weeks I've been a little bit behind in my emails. So if you've emailed me recently and you have not heard back, I I will be reaching out back out to you in the next um, in the next day or two. I've, I've pretty much already just got all caught up. So I'm hoping everybody is received. But I'm gonna d go back and double check soon. Um, if you wanted to post your drawings on Instagram or Facebook, go ahead and tag Insectopia2015. That is me on all of the social media platforms other than YouTube where we actually got Insectopia without the numbers. I was all excited. All right. Um, no frosted elephants out yet. Yeah, we want the buggies to, you know, stay aligned with the plants. All right, so... If the plants aren't out and about, we really shouldn't see, be seeing the buggies out and about yet. And with um, the way that the climate is changing and warming and heating and doing all types of funny things, it, um, it throws the alignment of the insects and the plants off of one another. And that is a dangerous mix because they have evolved together. So they should be, um, they should be working together in synchroni synchronicity and synchronous, synchronously. Yeah, something like that. All right, next week we are doing a water strider. I hope everybody has a fabulous rest of your week. Thank you for hanging out with me, and I hope that you all um, stay buggy. Bye, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>